All right, Tom left off with who better than Father Fred, and I'm thinking, okay, you can start a list and uh, <laughs> put me near the bottom, and I'll, if everybody else uh, can't make it, I'll, I'll show up. Um, um, first of all, I want to welcome all of you here today and see, tell you what a pleasure it is to see you here tonight. Um, and I know that um, the number of you are from other faith communities, and, and that always is so good, and it makes me and us feel so um, blessed to have your presence with us tonight. Um, could I just ask you to uh, just raise your hands if you're from a, from a different parish or different faith community? I just want all of us from St. Gabriel just to really welcome you and to tell you how good it is to have you with us tonight. Um, that's so much what Eucharist is all about, continuing to spread that good news and to gather people into one body. So that's a living expression of it. Um, so thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to start off with a little story. Um, and it's actually a true story. Um, and I was just dying for an occasion to use it. <laughs> so here you go, OK? Um, so. Um, for those of you who are from St. Gabriel's, you know that our mascot at St. Gabriel's School and St. Gabriel Athletics is the Grizzly. We are Grizzlies. We call our sports teams the Grizzlies and um, our students the Grizzlies. So that's a, a, a big um, symbol for who we are. Um, and so I have, through the uh, graciousness of our, CYO, of our uh, boosters and CYO programs, um, a good amount of uh, Grizzly apparel. <laughs> and it's really nice, you know, shirts and uh, jackets and, and, and the like. And so I, I wear them periodically. Not, I don't have the occasion to wear them very often, but uh, I found recently that uh, the shirts um, were really good sh shirts for me to wear to the gym um, for um, just they're, they're comfortable and they, they, they work real well. I remember one time I walked in and I had this big grizzly on me, and the, the, the guy at the desk said, oh, you're from Tennessee, aren't you? I said, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I can't, I don't know, I didn't realize there were Tennessee grizzlies, but, uh, but uh, nevertheless, and there's uh, oftentimes something on the back. Um, I have one really nice shirt that has a, a quote from Philippians, in Christ I can do all things, really very inspiring um, sometimes just um, nice words like be kind or things like that. But one particular shirt that I have that I tell you until this um, story I'm going to tell you I was not always enamored with uh, was the slogan, eat or be eaten. <laughs> <laughs> and it had some, some pretty grucious, uh, gruesome things on the back there. And I remember wearing that one time to the gym, and some, a couple of people commented on it. They looked at it and said, whoa, really? <laughs> <laughs> so then the other day, I was um, purging some of my stuff. You know how it piles up, and you want to say, OK, we can move this on. And I'm thinking, you know, some of this um, grizzly gear that I have, it's in real good condition. It's real good stuff. Uh, maybe Father Andy would like it. So. Um, I showed him this shirt with the uh, eat or be eaten on the back. <laughs> I, I didn't think that would be his quite, you know, his temperament or his style. Um, and he said, that's a good way to look at the Eucharist. And, and I was kind of shaken for a moment until I thought about it. I thought, wow, what a profound comment. As we live in a world that is so easy to be eaten up by in so many different ways. You can define that in whatever way may be your experience. But to eat, to eat the bread of life, to feed on the Lord himself may be the only real and certainly the best alternative we have. So um, that's uh, the little story I'd like to start out with tonight. I, I, I want to tell you this. Um, I feel very humbled um, and blessed to be able to share some thoughts with you this evening. Um, and I know very well, and you know very well too, I'm not coming to you as a scholar, as an expert, or any just to tell you what, what to do, what to not to do. I, I'm coming to you as a, 
a person who journeys with you in this life of discipleship, a person who uh, attempts, like, like you, to follow the Lord, a person who needs um, the influence and the input of others. We all do. Um, so please don't see it as anything more than that. I, I'm not here tonight to teach you. As a matter of fact, probably what I say you've heard before. And some of it you may agree with and may, may not agree with. I'll try, and I try to do my very best to represent what the church is teaching. But what I hope to do for all of us in one way or another is to help us to at least deepen in some way our appreciation for a gift that can never fully be understood, fathomed, or in this life, lived. But it's little by little when we gain these insights. And my prayer is, and I, you know, I will say this, I spent you know, time preparing what I wanted to say, but far more time just praying that God would give me what to say, and more importantly, that God would use what I have to say to at least touch some hearts who are here tonight in whatever way God chooses. And I may never know that, and it doesn't matter. What matters is that you allow that to happen, that you just open up your heart, open up your mind, and just say, God, what is it that you want me to hear about this precious gift of the Eucharist, the very, very center of our lives. I really, really appreciate that symbol that we are using that Maddie Lau made because it says so much with so little words. At the very center is the symbol of the Eucharist. All around it is all of us. And hopefully that circle gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But there are people joined in unity because we are one body in Christ. And that really says it very, very well uh, for me. So I want to start out by talking a little bit about a topic. And some of these topics are ones that can be talked about from a number of different uh, points of view uh, and probably may be familiar with you in some ways. But I want to just share with you perhaps some new perspectives or just my perspective. And I'd like to start out by talking about Eucharistic miracles, because I think we hear a lot about these, that these days, and I think that um, can be a very, very valuable thing and a very real thing. I think a lot of times people think when they hear those words, Eucharistic miracles, they think about recorded miracles that happened um, usually long ago, far away, but nevertheless important where there have been scientific data that the bread actually turned into flesh and the wine actually turned into wine and was preserved. And, and I don't know that I really know the, all the details of all that. I've read some things about it and had some, um, you know, some contact with it. And I don't deny it at all. And I don't mean to undermine its importance. Sometimes... God uses those kind of miracles to help people. That's really, I think, um, the biggest reason why God used miracles, period, is to just help people's faith, help them to believe deeper. And if it helps a person to believe deeper, deeper then so be it. But I think it cannot be with the exclusion of miracles that happen right here, right now, that so, are so easy to take, maybe miss or take for granted. And that's, those are the Eucharistic miracles that I want to talk a little bit about today at the beginning here. I first of all want to make that very important distinction, and sometimes distinctions help us to really understand the difference. The, dis the distinction between miracles and magic, because they could be confused, but you know that there is a great difference. Magic is illusion. And if we um, somehow, you know, allowed the miracles of God to be in that category of magic, we might conclude that they are illusions. 
It was an illusion that he made the blind man see. It was an illusion that he made the crippled walk. It was an illusion that, you name it, it wasn't an illusion. It was real. And that's what miracles are. Miracles are real. And they are the things that have the potential to change and the, the power to really transform our lives beyond expectation. Magic is for entertainment, right? It is, and it's fun, and it's entertaining, and it's really cool, and you always say, well, how'd you do that, and why, you know, that's it, really cool, but you know it's not real when somebody gets in a box and the magician saws them in half and say, oh, wow, that's, that's pretty cool, let me try that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. But miracles are real. They are the amazing, they start with, always start with, the amazing grace of God. It's a, it's a beautiful song. We sing amazing grace, but we have to take that really seriously. God's grace or God's life that he shares with us is beyond amazing. It's the amazing grace of God that, and I would say, ordinarily requires our response. And our response with God's grace, God's grace is certainly the driving force, but our response is what activates it, is what oftentimes what results in miracles beyond belief. So what I'd like to just put out there, because I think it's really true, is that Eucharistic miracles or God's miracles are not just things that happened long ago and far away and written up in books or displayed in whatever. Not Again, I'm not going to put those down, but miracles happen all around us in so many ways. Many of you, I know, have experienced the birth of a child. What a miracle. What a miracle. Life itself and how the human body works. What a miracle. No mechanic or engineer or architect could ever have figured that out. It's a miracle in my book. It's God's grace and certainly our cooperation with God's grace. I'm sure many of you at, at times, and we are so blessed where we live here, have experienced the beauty of a sunset and have just stood or sat there in awe, especially perhaps if you were near the water. I, I get a lot of grief from my family when we're out near the water and I keep taking pictures of sunsets. And they keep saying, it's the same sun. It looks the same all the time. How many pictures of that sun are you going to take? <laughs> they do the same when I take pictures of the castle at Disney. It's like, oh, it's, I, I can't stop. It's so amazing. But you know, with sunsets, there is something a little different in every one of us. It may be the, the color of the sky or the formation of the clouds or just something that I hear God speaking. It's a miracle how the sun and the stars and the moons are in order and the beauty that God gives us in so many ways. I, I really believe that that's a miracle that only God could do. Um, and, and the list could go on and on. And, and I would really encourage you, when we have a little time for discussion, talk about the miracles in your life, the things that have just, just knocked you over in terms of their wonder, in terms of their beauty, and more importantly, most importantly, in terms of how they help you to experience the awesome glory of God. The awesome glory of God. That's a miracle. Now, truly, they defy full explanation or proof. You just can't prove all these things. But they rest on the promise and the word of God to be with us always, to show us his presence in many ways, to guide our paths, to give us what we need, 
to fulfill that promise of the Old Testament, I will be your God and you will be my people forever, forever. And I, I really believe that some of these things that maybe we take for granted that I think are miraculous are expressions from God of saying, I am with you. This wouldn't be here if I weren't with you. It's just truly wonderful. Um, I, I'm sure that I share this with you, that in the life of faith, there are no such things as accidents, coincidences, or just dumb luck. I don't believe that. I believe that the things that happen in our lives, unless they're just things that we ourselves did by ourselves, that could be dumb luck. And I know that I'm probably part of that sometimes <laughs> myself. But, you know, the, the things in life that are really a part of what the essence of life um, that's God at work in our midst, beyond our understanding, and certainly beyond our worthiness. And sometimes all we can do is just be in awe and just be so grateful that there's something deep within us that wants us to respond to that with all our heart and just to say, praise you, God, thank you, God, and I give you my life, my God. That's what miracles are all about. They don't entertain. They transform our lives if we allow them to. Magic entertains, but miracles have the power to change us, have the power to change us. So in, in your own reflection, and perhaps in the, the uh, table discussion that we'll have a little later on, it would be good to um, talk about miracles in your own life. I know at the table I was sitting at, Mike, who was a guest with us tonight, shared a miracle in his life. And it's, it is a miracle. It's a real miracle. I won't share it with you. You can share it with the table. But it is a miracle. He knows he couldn't have done it by himself. Most things in life we can't do by ourselves. Most things in our lives that are of value we didn't do by ourselves. It's the grace of God. It's the miracle within us. So with that kind of as a, an introduction, I want to say a little bit about liturgy. Liturgy is the official public prayer of the church. We all know that. It's the celebration of the seven sacraments. It's the praying of the liturgy of the hours. It's certainly um, the public prayer of the church. It's what we, what we do together. The word, the Greek word liturgia, literally means work. That's what it means. It doesn't mean worship. It doesn't mean praise. It doesn't mean you know, ritual. It means work. And, and the truth is, liturgy, although it's meant to be worship and prayer and responding to God's love, should be very demanding of us in a number of ways and should be as our, as Catholic Christians, our greatest work. And, and these are some of the examples that I would use. Liturgy, I think, demands preparation. And if you think about it, most things in our lives demand preparation. Every once in a while, there's a spur-of-the-moment thing that seemed to work out okay. Okay, fine. But think about some of the really important things in life. Think about, like, if you're going on a really, um, really big vacation. You're not going to think about it, uh, you know, five minutes before it's leave, to leave for the airport or you get in the car to drive or whatever. You got to prepare for it. You got to pack for it. You got to think about the things you want to accomplish. You got to think about the things you need to bring, all those kind of things. And also, you prepare your spirits and say, I'm getting really excited. I can't wait to go on this trip or whatever it might be. Or maybe your, your job, your profession, or a project that you might have, whatever it might be. It takes preparation. What's it going to take? What do I need to know? How do I need to be ready for this? Whatever it might be. So my point on that is saying is that 
if liturgy is our greatest work, I think it really requires preparation. I think it means the preparation, first of all, of preparing our mind and our spirits, of really getting into that mindset of what we're going to do and the importance, the utmost paramount importance of what we're going to do and what it's really all about and how I enter into that that I didn't just come there because I come once a week or come every day or come whenever I come. Every single time is the blessing beyond compare. And we need to prepare our minds and our spirits so that, so that we really are ready. I know life is busy. And I know all of us have tons of things on our calendars. And we're going every which way, especially parents and grandparents I mean, there's so many demands on your lives. There are demands on our particular jobs or professions, whatever it might be. And it's like sometimes I see some of these families walking into church and I just say, God bless them and their five little children and what they must have gone through to get here. And they might be here like a minute or two late and I'm thinking, you know what? God bless them. God knows what they went through. And that was part of the preparation but for a lot of us, we may not have that. And we may have the luxury, and I will say it's a luxury, of preparing ourselves more spiritually if we devote ourselves to one of the realities of life. This is a reality for all of us. Is we all have seven days a week, 24 hours a day. That's not going to change. That's not different for one person than the other. And life is oftentimes about how we use those times in terms of the priorities of our lives, the things that really matter. And this matters the most in my book. So preparation is really important, and certainly some practical things. How beneficial it is to prepare the scriptures ahead of time, to at least have read over them, to think about maybe what is God saying to me here today? What do I think I'm going to hear today when I hear them proclaimed at the liturgy? How is the homily going to help me to become a better person, a better follower of Christ? Because I don't know about you, but if I don't do that, even from where I sit, a reading can go in one ear and out the other. I could get distracted just like that. But all of a sudden I'm thinking about this or thinking about that or thinking about that. But it helps so much when you've thought about those readings ahead of time, when you've really given conscious thought to what it is that we're going to do and the importance of what it is that we're going to do, that it's not just one more thing on the calendar, not just one more thing I'm going to do on Sunday morning or whenever you go, but it is the most important thing we do. And so I want to give it my very, very, very best. So... Um, I'll tell you another little story, true story. So when I was uh, ordained a priest eons ago um, and celebrated my first Mass of Thanksgiving, it was actually on Easter Sunday. It's kind of a unique situation, but it was really a, an incredible blessing after a rather difficult journey to get there. And to be honest with you, um, as I was going through the seminary, uh, I was very familiar with liturgy. I was a, what they would call in the seminary a master of ceremonies. I was in charge of, you know, making sure everybody knew what they were doing for liturgies and things like that. Everybody's role and everything. So I was pretty comfortable with that. I knew what to do. And even though I had never celebrated Mass before as a presider, I mean, I knew, I knew what to do. And as you probably know, I don't have a real difficult time talking. <laughs> So that's not something I just get real nervous about or anything. So I, I tend to talk a lot. Although I will tell you, when I gave the first homily I gave as a deacon, I was shook. And it wasn't because I didn't feel I could get up there and talk. It's because, and, and Bob can relate to this, because the awareness that I was representing the church and the Lord was like very humbling and even very scary, <laughs> um, but by the grace of God. So when, when I was there preparing for, um, to celebrate my first Mass of Thanksgiving, 
Uh, typically, you invite a lot of priest friends to come and celebrate with you, and I did. And because I was ordained a little later than the rest of my class, I had a lot of my classmates there who already were doing this and in this, and a lot of other priest friends. And that day, oh my goodness, I, I was shaking like a leaf. I was shaking like a leaf. And I would see one of my classmates and say, I am just shaking. I'm so, you got this. You know how to do this. What are you talking about? This is no piece of cake for you. You know how to do this. And I still kept shaking. And I still kept shaking. And, and I knew why. It wasn't that I didn't know how to do it. Uh, granted, I never did it before as a presider, but I knew what to do. It was far deeper reasons. So I had a really good friend of mine, and I don't mean to be a name caller here, or name dropper, but at the time we just called him Father Pilla. And he was, uh, he was a, a major influence in my life. And just from, I mean, I knew him from the second grade on, certainly through the seminary, teacher, friend, and, and really just a great, great example on, on forever. And we'll say till the day he died, but forever. Just one of the greatest people I ever met. And so he was there, um, and he was one of the major consulates, so one of the closest people to me, the people that are most important, closest to me. And, and I said to him, I said, I'm really, really shaking here. And, and I was getting scared a little bit. So I come on, I got to get this together here because um, it's going to start pretty soon. And he said to me something I'll never forget. He said, Freddie, I hope you never stop shaking when you celebrate the Eucharist. And I'll always remember that. And, and you know what? I really vowed that day to never, ever make this something just comfortable that I could just, you know, blow right through because I've done it a million times. And I would really encourage you to do the same. That's what we need to bring by way of preparation. What the church calls us to in very, I think, familiar words to you, and very important and well-chosen words from the Second Vatican Council in the, uh, in the, in the Sacred Constitution on, on the Sacred Liturgy is that it calls for full, active, and conscious participation by all the faithful. Not just the people who have, well, let me just explain what I'm saying. Not just people who have the roles that you think we have, like the role of presider, the role of deacon, the role of reader, the role of Eucharistic minister, the role of music minister, the role of greeter, the role... Yeah, those are important roles. But it, 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 it's sad sometimes that we don't often talk about the role of the assembly, which includes every person there. That's our role. There is no such thing when we celebrate liturgy as spectators. There is no such things as people who are there just to watch or just to be there and check the box. We are there as players. Sometimes I use the example of like if you've gone to a, a football game or a concert or something like that. There are people in the bleachers or in the, in, in the audience or wherever, however it's structured. And then there's people on the field or people on the stage. We're not in the bleachers. We're not in the, in the spectator seats. We're on the field, everybody. We're on the stage, not to be seen, but to really give our best. And I think that's what full, active, co conscious participation is all about. And I don't think that can happen without good preparation. To go back to that, it's really important. It's how do we worship, pray, and serve with our entire being. And I know sometimes, you know, it, it kinda, it's kind of funny, but not so funny. You can go to a sporting event or something else, and people just are amazing how excited they are and cheering and going crazy and sometimes, you know, off the chart a little bit. It's like, settle down here, settle down, it's just a game. But when we come to liturgy, we're so subdued, you know, we either sing under our breath or hardly sing at all. Uh, we make responses very quietly. We don't want to disturb anybody. Somebody next to me may be sleeping after the homily, so I don't want to wake them up. You know, that kind of thing. You know what? Wake them up. <laughs> and wake up, all of us. 
we need to really be excited about a liturgy and, and, and excitement should show not only in physical ways, but from the very depths of our souls. So here's another little story. And all these are true stories, okay? So in my first assignment, um, I had the, just a the tremendous blessing of meeting just an incredible man. He was, at that time, quite a bit older than I. Uh, at this time, God has called him home. He was, um, he was a legend, and he was just so charismatic in the truest meaning of that word. And he really got it. I mean, the, the Vatican Council was just, the new, new changes were just starting to get underway at that time. But he really got it, embraced it with his whole being, and lived it in every way. He lived it in every way. When he was in the room, there seemed to be a force that just came into that room. You knew Jim was there. So when he was at Mass, it came time to sing, he would just sing like, oh my goodness, he would sing his heart out. He had the worst voice in the world. <laughs> and finally, I had the courage to say, Jim, and we were really good friends. I don't know quite how to say this to you. You're such a great guy, you know. But you don't have the greatest voice in the world. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. And he said, I know that. He said, God gave me this voice. I'm giving it right back to him. <laughs> and then, well, that's the spirit. And from then on in, he kept on singing, and I kept my mouth shut and sang my own way. So um, that's what full, active, and conscious participation, I think, is all about. So whatever, God, whatever voice God gave you, give it back to him. But give it back to him with all your heart and all your love. Because no matter how you sing, if it comes from a heart of love and gratitude, it's a beautiful voice. It's a beautiful voice. Um, so that's the first thing. Liturgy means work. This shouldn't be easy. This should not be easy. You know, I, I tell people sometimes, it's not just because I'm getting older and maybe a little weaker. I, I think I'm doing okay, but um, when, when I get done celebrating Mass and I try to give my very, very best, I'm tired. I am. It really takes it out of me. I mean, quite honestly, when I was younger, I was able to do it better, but um, doing like two Masses right in a row, whoa, that takes it really out of me. And it should for all of us. I mean, we should not so much feel tired, exhausted, but tired, just really spent and feeling really good about it. You know, it's like when you finish a, a project and you worked hard on it and you, you, you're done with it and you sit back and you say, ah, that was really great. That was really, really great. I gave it my very best and I, I'm really, really happy with what I did. So that's the first part. Liturgy is, is work and it's the work of everyone. Full, active, conscious. Sometimes people seem like they're a little bit unconscious, but um, it's not mine to judge. Participation on everybody's part. The second thing I want to say about liturgy is that liturgy is always, always communal. It is the action of the entire community. That is why singing and responding and common postures are so important because all of them speak to the nature of communal prayer. Liturgy is never a me and God prayer. Now, there is time for me and God prayer, and there is an importance to me and God prayer at times, but liturgy is never a me and God prayer. It's always all of us together. Um, I, I heard an example, an, an, an image a long time ago that always really resonates with me um, in terms of understanding the place of different kinds of praying. So um, there certainly is private prayer. And, and I really encourage you to have a private prayer life, however, however that is for you. There's certainly a very beautiful place for communal, for, for uh, devotional prayer. That's really good when people pray together. And then there's liturgical prayer. And the image that Pope Paul VI gave with that 
was the image of this huge flowing river. Think about the Mississippi, something huge. And rivers have tributaries that go in and go out. And if they didn't, they would dry up or they would overflow. He said those tributaries are, are really important. They keep the river flowing well. But it's the river that matters. And he says it's the river that is liturgical prayer, private prayer, and, and the other devotional prayers. They're all the tributaries, and they're good. And they really enhance the quality of liturgical prayer. But they are not on the same level at all. Tributaries and big flowing rivers are not the same. And liturgical prayer is the mainstream of prayer life in the church. So it's always communal prayer. Um, one of the things, I, I might have written this down later, that just is really very helpful to me here at St. Gabriel Parish. And I will be the first to say, it's not a part of the official rite. It's not, certainly nothing wrong with it. But it's not something you may find everywhere. So if you're not doing it in the parish you go to or, or belong to or whatever, it's not like they're missing the boat. Or if you find out we're doing that here, you say, like, what are they, why are they doing that? That's not right. It is right. Um, so at the very beginning of our liturgies, our, our parishioners know this very well, the cantor usually um, welcomes people and, and says, you know, today is the whatever Sunday of the year or whatever it might be, the feast or whatever, and says, I invite you all to stand and please turn and face one another recognizing one another as the body of Christ. When we first started doing that, people misunderstood that. They thought, okay, let's turn to the center aisle and watch the priest and the servers come up the aisle and see who's got the mass today and if there's a deacon and which one it might be. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. It's not that at all. It's not that at all. It's looking at each other and saying, we are the body of Christ. This isn't just me and God going to that altar so I can receive communion. It's the body of Christ celebrating together who we are and strengthening who we are as Christ's body here on earth. So that is really, really important because that's ultimately our call, is to become what we receive. So liturgical prayer is always communal. And we'll say a little bit more about that in terms of some of the expressions of what that means. The second thing is liturgical prayer is always, always the action of Christ. It's not primarily what we do, but what we, how we respond to what God is doing for us, starting with his invitation to come and certainly to share in his life, in his grace, in his meal, and certainly to go out and to become what we receive to do the work that he calls us to do. The challenge and the call of Christ to become what we received. But I would really encourage you to always think about that. That this isn't what we're doing. This is what Christ is doing. And we are responding to by way of invitation and by way of participation and by the way we live it out in our lives. So in, in many ways, um, all of the sacraments call us to do this in one way or another. But I will say, and I think this is fair enough to say, as important as each sacrament is and the liturgy of the hours are, it's the Eucharist that really is at the center of the sacramental life of the church and hopefully the center of our lives as God's followers. So I want to say a word about Liturgy as celebration, and that's the goal, primarily because, and perhaps you recognize these words from a rather familiar song that we use often, but it's really important. It's not just nice words to a nice song. It's because our God is here. That's what we believe. We don't even bother showing up if you don't believe God's going to be there. Do something else. But we believe that our God is here. And that's why we come together to celebrate. How can you not celebrate if you really believe that our God is here? Not up there, not out there, not over there, right here, right present among us. What a gift. 
What an awesome, awesome gift that our God is here. And it's true in all the sacraments, in baptism. Our God is here to adopt us as his children. And he promises us unconditional and eternal love. That's our God. It's not just a priest or a deacon pouring water and people doing some nice things there. Our God is there. Our God adopts us and promises us to be with us always. Our God confirms us as his people by his Holy Spirit with a promise to dwell within us, to guide us, and to strengthen us in everything we do. Our God is there to forgive us, to reconcile us when we come together to really celebrate and share his mercy in the sacrament of reconciliation. Our God is there in all the sacraments and most importantly, in the Eucharist. Oftentimes, and I know it's through the goodness of people, I and clergy oftentimes get thanked for things that we have no right to be thanked for. Thank you, Father, for celebrating Mass today. Oh, you don't have to thank me. I didn't die on the cross and rise for you. Jesus did. I'm just here to fulfill my role and my call, and I understand that. And I understand what they're saying, too. But oftentimes, just about everything, people will come and say, thank you. Like when people celebrate reconciliation, they'll say, well, thank you. That really meant a lot to me. Well, you don't have to thank me. I didn't die on the cross for you. I'm just here as the messenger. I'm just here to convey God's love, God's mercy, God's gift for you, because our God is here. And certainly, certainly, most importantly, in the Eucharist, in the real presence, in what we see as simple bread and simple wine. Tom talked about that already. It's at the very core of our faith is belief in the real presence. And I know there's a lot of concern about lack of belief or lack of understanding or perhaps some ambiguity about what does that mean? I don't, doesn't taste like blood to me, doesn't taste like flesh to me, doesn't look any different to me. You're right. I mean, no one gets closer than me. I can tell you it doesn't look, feel any different. There's a difference between physical presence and sacramental presence. Sacramental presence is real presence, even deeper. One of the definitions of a sacrament is it affects what it signifies. In other words, it actually does what, it, what it's a symbol of or a, sig a sign of, not a symbol, a sign of. Like water is a sign of life. And you can, there's a number of different ways you can look at that. But it really does give life. The life of baptism is without a doubt. And that's why we use water and light and oil. In the Eucharist, bread and wine is food. But it actually becomes what it signifies, and that is the Lord who gave his life for us. That was no story. That was real. He gave his life for us. He could have said all those words, but if he wasn't willing to offer his life for us on the cross and rise, everybody dies, but not everybody rises from the dead. That's what Eucharist is all about. It's a celebration that Jesus enables us to do that over and over again through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Eucharist is all about, and that's what real presence is all about. Not physical, but sacramental is real. It's real. It's not just like a, a picture. This is beautiful. The pictures that you see on the screens out there are all beautiful. They're pictures. They're not real. They're just reminders. They're symbols. They're really good. This is real. As real as I'm here, as real as you're here, Jesus is real in that form of simple bread and simple wine. 
And we know that, we believe that, because he told us. Now let me ask you, is that a miracle? Absolutely that's a miracle. That's a miracle that happens every time we come together and celebrate. There is just no doubt about it. So can you prove it? No. Faith demands belief, not proof. We have Christ's word. This is my body, which will be given up for you. This is my blood, which will be shed for you. Now, those are nice sounding words, and we repeat them in every Mass. But he didn't just say those words. You know what happened the next day. You know without a word, that's what this is my body, this is my blood was all about as he hung on the cross. And when he rose from the dead, he said, I am with you always. I am with you always. That's the miracle. That's the miracle that we are called to put our absolute faith in and to believe in with all of our hearts. We, ha we have witnesses, again, through others of his life and resurrection. We have his word through the living word that we share uh, in the Bible. So that's the real presence of God in the Eucharist, in the form of bread and wine. But I think there are other ways that sometimes hardly get noticed that are really important to celebrate the real presence. What about the real presence of God in the living word proclaimed at Mass? That's not like just picking up a book, even a nice book, even a very spiritual book, and reading from it. A history book, a novel book, there's a lot of good ones out there. This is, and I tell the children this all the time, this is God speaking to us right here, right now. Our God is here, and he's speaking to us. And he's got something to say to you. And it may not be the same to everybody. It may be just a word. But that's a miracle that God can speak to us now through words that were written hundreds if not thousands of years ago and now are the living word of God. Not just a history book. The living word of God. I think that's a, a miracle. And it can only happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how that works. It was the Holy Spirit that guided the church way back in the early centuries to choose the books that would be in what's called the canon of the Bible. The Bible itself is like a library with like 70, how many books? 73 books in the Bible. Um, and, and other Bibles have a, a couple different ones. But there are a lot of different sacred writings. But the church, through the power of the Holy Spirit, chose these through great prayer and deliberation as the inspired word of God, the inspired word of God, the living word of God. And that's a miracle that God would find a way to speak to us today through his living word. I believe there's also um, a miracle in the person of the presider. Like, I know what you're thinking. Like, <laughs> Really, I know, that is a miracle that he's up there. <laughs> it's not quite what I mean, um, but quite honestly, it's not that far as you think either. But, but I will tell you this, that the priest is there in the person of Christ, not in his own person. We call that in persona Christi. It's never about the priest. It's always about the priest every time. So look beyond whoever the presider may be and his or her particular ways or styles or whatever and see that Jesus is present. It's not the priest himself, the ordained priest. It's Jesus who works through that, that priest and who, Jesus who gathers us, leads us, speaks to us, and feeds us. And that's a miracle. That's a miracle that Jesus can do that and that, to me, also is real presence. Real presence happens in a lot of ways. And one of the ways that I don't think gets enough emphasis is that Jesus is truly present in the assembly, in all of you, 
united in the Spirit, the one body of Christ called to become what we receive, the body of Christ. That's why the words that we've chosen as our vision for our parish are so significant. Being Christ every day, everywhere. And I remember when we were first you know, fashioning that line, people said, well, yo, no, you can't be Christ. Well, how about like being like Christ? No, it's being Christ every day, everywhere, in the best way that we can be. And again, that we can be Christ is a miracle. You know, uh, you probably know that I'm a, a big Disney person. <laughs> and um, so I, 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 I try to learn a lot about the philosophy. It's not the Mickey Mouse stuff. And I, that's fine and everything. I enjoy it and we have fun and everything. But it's more the philosophy. What are the operating principles? How, what's, what's, what's underneath all that? That's why, you know, studying Walt's life and, and, and his vision and his, his gifts were so important to me. And there's a, a Disney principle um, that I found just incredibly um, useful because what, what, one of the reasons that attracts me to it is so much of what they do is so helpful to us and anywhere, no matter where you are. But there is a, a, a really important principle that says everything speaks. That's it. Everything speaks. So you don't put a fantasy land garbage can in, in adventure land. You don't do this, that, because every little thing speaks. So I want to just say to you, pay attention to the little things. Pay attention to the minor rites of the liturgy because they oftentimes hold the key to a deeper understanding of what Eucharist is all about. Certainly the major parts are the liturgy of the Word, the liturgy of the Eucharist. We know that. But let me just point out some other things that could be taken for granted. The, the gathering rite, when we gather, how important that is that we are really aware that we are one family gathered in God's love. That's why that saying, turn and face each other, recognizing one another as the body of Christ, is so valuable. When we call to mind our sins, our unworthiness, and we come with grateful and humble and confident hearts before a God of mercy, and in a sense, cry out, Lord have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. I know that. I know I'm not worthy of that. But thank you, Lord, for your great mercy. We give glory to God. That's not just a nice song. It just reminds us of why we're there, to really praise our God. And there are times in the year, um, Advent or Lent, when we fast from that so that we don't take that too much for granted. So that when we, when we sing that glory to God again, it really has meaning. And certainly that opening prayer that has a funny name, funny pronunciation of the name to it, it's, it's called the collect. And it sounds like collect. It's spelled just the same way. But that's what it means. It means to collect up all that's in our hearts, all that's in our lives, and bring them to our good and loving God. Those introductory rites, they're called, gathering rites, are really, really important. And then the next thing I want to point out to you is this. Um, that we bring up the gifts. Now, it would be a lot quicker, simpler, just put them up there beforehand. You save the trouble of people walking all the way on the aisle, finding the right people, waiting for them to get up there. <laughs> Not, that's so important because two things. Number the one, the gifts are from the people. Whoever's chosen to bring them up represents all of us. And the gifts are us. Simple gifts. They are bread, wine, they are you, me, simple, but given to God. And that's really an important part of the Mass. We, I pray we'd never, ever lose that. Um, as we um, pray the Mass, there's a Eucharistic formula that you will hear in one way or another through the Eucharistic prayer. And that is simply this, that Jesus takes the gifts, takes the bread. Jesus blesses it, gives thanks for it, breaks it, and gives it. That's the Eucharistic formula, and that's what we are called to do and allow God to do with our lives, because God does give thanks for us, but he wants to break us, in other words, use us in so many different ways, and we need to be there to give of ourselves. Uh, the next thing is, is a sign of peace. Uh, that sounds like an option, 
But I want to just say something. This is one of those things where perhaps we've veered off the road a little bit. This is not a hi, how are you? Oh, nice to see you over there. How you doing back there? Or, 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 or this piece, you know, that was a 60s peace sign. This is a, a very reverent act of a, a conscious decision of reconciliation. You can't be reconciled with everybody. So to the person next to you, either a reverent bow, a simple handshake, an appropriate hug, or whatever that might be. But it's not meant to get everybody's attention and to make sure everybody, you caught in everybody and, you know, hi, how are you type thing. During the pandemic, I know that's where it went off the rails. People were separated apart, nobody's allowed to touch each other, and that, that kind of stuff. So it kind of, those kind of things kind of snuck in. We need to let them out the back door and say, this needs to be a very reverent to the person next to you. That's what the right calls for the person next to you. That's, um, that's another small thing that means a lot. And then finally, at the end, we call it the missioning rite, when we are sent forth with God's blessing and the admonition from the deacon, go in peace now to love and to serve the world and to bring God's gospel to others. That is not, okay, we're done. See you next week. Let's get out of here. Got things to do. No, yeah, you do got things to do. You got plenty to do to bring that gospel, to bring the, the, the presence of Christ to others. That's really, really significant. Quick word about, I know Bob's giving me the evil eye back there, and pretty soon I'm going to see him come up with the cane and say, but I just want to say, um, I'll be done uh, probably another hour, Bob. So I want to say a quick word about Eucharistic adoration because I, I think it, I know it has a very, very valuable place in helping us to deepen our life with the Eucharist. It never takes the place of the Eucharistic celebration, of the liturgical celebration. But what I want to say to you, this, is that there are alternate forms to the traditional way. Now, there's nothing to say in the traditional way isn't good. You know, coming before the Blessed Sacrament has great value, really um, praying there and allowing God to, to speak to us and to really time for prayer and adoration with others and ourselves, too. But I would also say it's uh, another forms of Eucharistic adoration are challenging ourselves to use the Gospels as a means of, of, of imitating Christ. How do we really become what we hear? Not, what we only, not only what we receive, but what we hear. Um, and ways the Scriptures helps us to do that. Training ourselves to see and reverence the presence of Christ in others. Yeah, it's good to have reverence before the tabernacle. Yeah, it's good to have reverence before the monstrance with the Blessed Sacrament. But what about the Christ within us? When we treat each other sometimes with unkindness or make judgments or say things that aren't kind, shouldn't we be bowing or even genuflecting to each other? Now, I know that's not going to happen. But treating each other with respect as vessels of Christ really needs to happen. How do we develop an ever deeper sense of really actively listening to God's word, not just to the stories, but what is God saying to me? That is, you, that is adoration, really listening actively to what God is saying. Honestly discerning our gifts when those gifts are brought up and saying, what is it that I have to offer to God? It's not that just I'm going to volunteer when, you know, I, I have to or somebody puts the pressure on me. It's like, I have gifts. I need to give them. I need to share them. It's by developing a spirit of gratitude. And you know what the word Eucharist means. It means thanksgiving. That our lives are a constant expression of gratitude for the goodness of God. And if we believe we are sent and do what we honestly see ourselves and, we, and we, do we honestly see ourselves on a mission and are we willing and eager and committed to go? And then one of the last things I'm going to say to you is this. Pay attention to um, the example of two of Jesus' best friends, Martha and Mary. Um, both. Do we have, are we comfortable with Mary's role, to just put ourselves at the feet of Jesus and listen. I think sometimes we do too much talking. We're just rattling one prayer off or another, da, da, da. oh my goodness. 
but we listen so that we can be like Martha, a servant, a person of hospitality. Um, Jesus told us, sometimes just be in his presence. We all, don't always have to do the talking. Um, even sometimes devotions that are good can become a hindrance if they just are one thing after another, and we don't take time to say, what's the Lord saying to us? Mary's example is so valuable, it enables us to be servants like Martha. So, how can we encounter Christ in a personal and intimate way, not only at Mass, which is the primary, the focal point, but how do we do that even outside of Mass? How do we become living tabernacles? And I think Deacon Bob shared this with me, so if I use his name, he'll probably give me two extra minutes here. Um, how do we become living tabernacles that have the presence of Christ within us, which is really just an awesome thought, but even more, a living monstrance that demonstrates, shows the presence of Christ to others. You know, we have a, a beautiful tabernacle here and a beautiful monstrance here, as all parishes do. But they can't move. They don't leave the building. They stay right here. You move. You leave the building. You need to be that tabernacle. We do. We need to be that monstrance. So I'm just going to leave you with a couple questions, um, and then we're going to get into some discussion. When we come forth to receive the most precious and awesome gift of our God, and that is the Eucharist, we hear the minister of the Eucharist either the body of Christ or the blood of Christ, say, let's just say, the body of Christ. And we say, Amen. what does that mean? Yeah. Yes. What else does that mean? I believe. What is it that you believe? What is it that you're saying yes to? It means you are saying that I am your body. I am your presence. That's what it means, and that's a miracle. That's a miracle that we, in our sinfulness, our lowliness, our, our brokenness, can be the miracle of Christ within us. And, and the last question is this. You know, we say this at every Mass. What, Jesus, what did Jesus mean when he said at the Last Supper, do this in remembrance of me? And I'm going to give you the answer. He meant everything that he does. He meant everything. He didn't mean just come together once a week and have Mass. He meant everything. He meant take care of people. He meant go the extra mile. He meant forgive your neighbor. He meant give your life. Do this in remembrance of me. So search for the miracle. The miracle of the Eucharist that lies within you. Thanks, everyone.